Welcome back to the swamp, everyone. We are in for a treat today as we are finally once again taking an in-depth look at another cryptid. Today I am looking into one of my personal favorites, coming from my local area. The skunk ape legends are rampant here. I once again have teamed up with my friend T.W. Grimm, who has helped me put together all of this information for you guys. Without further hesitation, let's get into the story of the skunk ape. Shortly before Christmas in the year of 2000, a household in Florida was jarred awake in the middle of the night by a loud commotion on their back porch. It sounded like a human intruder was clumsily staggering around and knocking over the patio furniture, but the pandemonium outside was accompanied by a series of low, rumbling grunts that couldn't possibly come from a human being. There was a sickening odor in the air, an eye-watering combination of skunk and rotten garbage. It permeated the entire house in a suffocating blanket of stench. When the startled residents gathered enough courage to take a peek out the window, they caught sight of something that made them stare in open-mouthed disbelief. An enormous primate was stealing apples from a basket in their back deck. The encounter resulted in two very clear photographs of an ape-like beast, which were sent to the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department on December 22, 2000, with a letter that asked for anonymity. The woman who sent the letter claimed that the intruder had been stealing apples from their deck for about three nights in a row. The creature pictured in the photos would come to be known as the Mayaka skunk ape, and the incident became yet another chapter in the history of a living enigma which has haunted the swamplands of Florida for centuries. The Seminole and Mikosuke tribes of the region have told tales of the skunk ape in their oral traditions for hundreds of years. It is said to be somewhat shorter in stature than its Pacific Northwest counterpart, the Sasquatch, but still a formidable brute in its own right. A bipedal hominid that can reach heights between six and a half and seven feet, equipped with long, powerful arms and covered by a dense coat of reddish-brown fur. Its most noted feature is the animal's overwhelming odor, which has been theorized as being caused by the musky stench of methane-heavy swamp gas penetrating its coat. The skunk ape's environment is rife with danger. It's home to several varieties of poisonous snakes, alligators, crocodiles, wild boar, panthers, and in more recent years, a thriving python population. To survive in this environment, the skunk ape would have to near the top of the food chain, an omnivorous goliath capable of feeding on insects, plants, and just about any animal unfortunate enough to trigger the monstrous hominid's undoubtedly enormous appetite. There is video footage of an alleged skunk ape casually tearing large strips of bark from the trunk of a cypress tree. This impressive feat of strength being accomplished from a sitting position. There is little doubt that such a powerful and well-adapted animal might easily carve itself a comfortable niche in the forested swamplands of Florida. Eyewitness reports of this legendary beast have been coming out of the Sunshine State since the early 1900s. The first verified published account of a skunk ape came from the Suwannee County in 1942 reported by a motorist who claimed one of the creatures hitched a ride on one of his running boards for roughly half a mile. In 1957, two hunters camping in Big Cypress National Reserve had their camp raided by a hairy, simian intruder, and there was a period between 1963 and 1979 where multiple reports were made in three different counties. Since then, there have been many more additional sightings, some of them accompanied by photographic and video evidence. The witnesses are all from widely varied walks of life, ranging from outdoorsmen, a minister, a busload of foreign tourists, and even the chief of the Okopi Fire Control District. Skunk ape sightings generally take place in southern Florida, but they have been spotted as far north as Tallahassee. The majority of them, however, center around the Florida Everglades. The Everglades is a region of tropical wetlands that covers 1.5 million acres at the southern tip of Florida. 
The wildlife of the Everglades is extremely diverse, including the Florida panther, wild boars, the bottlenose dolphin, bobcats, coyotes, the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, the west Indian manatee, and uh, even a variety of black bear. There are many areas that are rarely visited by humans in this watery, humid wilderness. A skunk ape wouldn't seem terribly out of place in a region that is home to big cats, bears, pilot whales, flying squirrels, and flamingos. Indeed, many species of great apes can be found in wet, tropical climates that are not much different than the conditions found in the Everglades. To have a better understanding of any myth or legend, it's helpful to examine the place of its origin, and the people who live there. In the case of the skunk ape, the place of origin is the state of Florida, which has a very interesting geological history. The foundation of Florida began in its existence as a part of the polar continent Gondwana, which existed from the Neo-Proterozoic era and the Jurassic era, between 550 and 180 million years ago. Gondwana collided with the continent Laurentia in 300 million BC and began drifting north. By 200 million BC, the combined continents had settled in a spot north of the equator. At that time, Florida was surrounded by desert in the middle of a new supercontinent, a sprawling landmass known as Pangaea. When Pangaea broke apart 115 million years ago, the separation created the Florida Platform, a flat geological structure that rises thousands of feet from the ocean floor. The emergent part of this platform is the Florida Peninsula. The glaciation period of 2.58 million years ago made sea levels drop 330 feet lower than they are at present, swelling the area of the Florida Peninsula to nearly twice the size it is today. The end result was a vast plateau of dry land, bordered by what would become the Gulf of Mexico to the west and the North Atlantic to the east. The first human inhabitants of Florida were Palco Indians, who arrived during the tail end of this glacial period, roughly 15,000 years ago. Florida's climate was much colder and very dry, with most available fresh water found only in sinkholes or trapped within limestone basins. All human activity during this time was centered around these infrequent watering holes. Around 10,000 years ago, the glaciers retreated causing sea levels to rise and reducing the land mass. As a result, Florida's climate became much warmer and wetter, ushering in the early archaic period that replaced the Paleo-Indian culture. With more water available, the population expanded into areas that were previously uninhabited by humans. As the early archaic period evolved into the Middle Archaic, people began to establish small villages that bordered from freshwater wetlands by the time of the late archaic period, some 3,000 years ago, the climate conditions in Florida were similar to the present day, and its inhabitants were living in large villages fortified by man-made earthworks. The natives of southern and eastern Florida lived in isolation from outside influences until the year 1513, when the Spanish conquistador Juan Ponce de Leon led the first official expedition into this uncharted territory. He landed on the eastern coast, then proceeded to sail around much of the peninsula. Believing that the land he'd named La Florida was right for the taken, Ponce de Leon returned in 1521 to establish a colony on the southwest coast. However, the Calusa, who were the dominant indigenous tribe in southern Florida at the time, saw things differently. They attacked the would-be colonists and drove them off in a hail of arrows. Ponce de Leon himself was mortally wounded by an arrow poisoned with the sap of the Macanil tree and he died of his wounds back in Spanish-controlled Puerto Rico. The Spanish continued to send expeditions into Florida, determined to find gold and exploit the natural resources of this tropical enigma. But the Everglades proved to be too great of a challenge, and it remained largely unexplored up until the 19th century. In 1897, the explorer Hugh Willoughby wrote, we have a tract of land 130 miles long and 70 miles wide that is much unknown to the white man as the heart of Africa. During this time period, the remnants of several native tribes had banded together to form the Seminole tribe, who hid from the interference of Europeans within the boundaries of the Everglades. During their infrequent contacts with European descended colonists, 
They sometimes relayed stories of giant primates that lived in the swamps, an elusive beast of enormous size and strength. They called it Estekapkake, or the Tall Man. They believed the Tall Man was the protector of the swamps, a mystic overseer who would vigilantly keep watch over those who entered its domain, much similar to the Swamp Dweller character. It wasn't long before Florida's newest residents began to have their own encounters with the skunk ape. Throughout the latter half of the 20th century, there have been numerous sightings, some accompanied by photographic evidence and in some cases even capturing it on video. But what is the skunk ape exactly? Where did it come from? And how did it come to pass that these shaggy bipeds called the Everglades home? Assuming that the skunk ape is a living and breathing mammal, it stands to reason that it must have evolved from earlier forms of life. North America is currently not a known habitat for primates, but this wasn't always so. At the beginning of the Eocene, 56 million years ago, a new family of early primates known as the Amayids appeared on the landmass that would eventually become known as the United States of America. During this epoch, global temperatures were much higher than today. There were crocodiles in the Arctic, pine forests in the Antarctic, the tropical forests covered much of what is now North America. This group of primates are thought to have become extinct when the climate turned cooler during the subsequent Oligocene Epoch, and it appears that primitive primates disappeared in the New World. It could be speculated that these diminutive tree dwellers may have radiated south during a period known as the Great American Interchange, when North and South America became connected by a narrow land bridge. They also could have arrived on the southern shores as castaways, trapped on floating islands. There used to be floating islands of soil and vegetation that were torn away from the shoreline during violent megastorms. During the Oligocene, mammals began to increase in size taking advantage of the vast expanses of land and resources made available for the extinction of the dinosaurs. The comparatively small mammals of the Eocene gave way to larger life forms, who eventually evolved into megafauna, such as giant sloths, a species of short-faced bear that weighed in at around 3,500 pounds, and a small hornless rhinoceros that stood 18 feet at the shoulder. Could it be that North America's first small primates also gave way to larger versions of themselves during this period? Is it possible that a number of early North American primates made their way south and evolved in obscurity on any of the numerous islands located south of the Florida Peninsula? When the Ice Age trapped hundreds of feet of seawater in the encroaching glaciers which covered large portions of the planet, the hulking descendants of the Omomids could have found themselves returning to the north, following the same route as the Paleo-Indians who settled Florida 15,000 years ago. Just as humankind overcomes and adapts to hostile changes in climate and habitat, so do the animals that share our environment. While some become extinct, others evolve. Short fur becomes a long, shaggy coat. Small becomes large, poor eyesight sharpens to near telescopic focus and even the manner in which a creature dwells in its habitat can drastically change. Human beings once lived in trees, and winged birds of prey took to the ground as massive, flightless predators who could run down their quarry on foot. It would not be outside the realm of possibility that small primates of the Eocene may have evolved to become much larger and capable of bipedal locomotion. When Florida's climate grew warmer and wetter, such a creature could easily adapt to living in swamp conditions. With plentiful food sources and a scarcity of predators, a great ape could thrive in a secret for countless generations. The progenitors of the skunk ape may have continued to spread across the continent over the course of time, evolving and adapting to their new habitats as they pushed their way north. This could account for the legend of the Sasquatch another towering bipedal hominid that has been reported across the northwest for centuries. Somewhat larger than its southern counterpart, the Sasquatch roams the forests and mountainous areas of the Pacific Northwest, far afield from the wetlands of Florida. The two cryptids are strikingly similar, and they could very well be cousins within the same branch of the evolutionary tree. 
The prehistoric megafauna fell victim to climate change, or were hunted to extinction by our ancestors. If the skunk ape is, in fact, a distant descendant of a far smaller North American primate of the past, it stands to reason that it, too, was threatened by the encroaching presence of this new apex predator. The decidedly inhospitable conditions found within Everglades would have offered protection from relentless hunting by Paleo-Indians and the archaic peoples who replaced them. When the Seminole tribe retreated to the Everglades in search of similar refuge from the muskets of their European invaders, it's possible they would have had occasional run-ins with the reclusive brute in their shared habitat. In this manner, the legend of the tall man was born. Although there are many eyewitness accounts, footprint casts, some pictures and even video that purports to depict the skunk ape in action, there has never been a specimen brought forth for scientific analysis. Of course, this doesn't mean that such a specimen doesn't exist. No one has ever dredged the swamps in search of skeletal remains, and given the rapid growth of vegetation in warm, humid conditions, remains would be really hard to find. Even remains located in areas of dry land will be quickly obscured by layers of hummus and decaying plant matter. It is the age-old debate of proven versus possible. Anything is possible, even if it's very unlikely. But without irrefutable evidence, nothing can be said to exist outside the realm of our own imaginations. With this being said, although I am a confirmed skeptic, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if someone were to someday bring forth some tangible evidence of this cryptid. Some bones, an unidentifiable hair sample, something that would vindicate the dozens of people who claim to have seen the elusive beast with their very own eyes. Skepticism is not the same as dogmatic denial. A true skeptic doesn't take anything at face value, but is willing to entertain any possibility that can be demonstrated to have roots in reality. Conversely, Without the gift of wonder, humankind would have never left the Stone Age. Our planet is a theater of the fantastic, and many strange players have wandered across the stage over the course of its long and fascinating history. I feel there is a possibility that the skunk ape could be the result of evolution. Even if that possibility is very slight, it still exists, and it can't be diminished without empirical evidence to the contrary. In the end, no one has proved this legend to be reality, and they haven't disproved it either. As such, it's up to you to decide what you believe to be true. Unless you happen to come face to face with the tall man yourself, of course. If you do, I wish you the best of luck, and I hope you get the opportunity to snag a hair sample. Be careful though, or the skunk ape might decide to collect a sample of its own. Thank you for watching another one of our investigative documentaries. We hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, Please like and share and leave your comments in the comments down below. Until next time, stay open-minded and remember to always be ready to challenge the status quo. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.